Hello, I'm Brett Moss, and you're watching The Defining Moment for Creating the Culture of Conscience. Our guest today is Reverend Keith Russell Lee. Reverend Lee is the accomplished pastor of Destiny Church, which is located in the suburbs of Chicago. Keith is also an entrepreneur. His book, Power, Faith, and Living, offers a spiritual guide to creating an extraordinary life. He's currently working on a PhD from Trinity Theological Seminary in Indiana. Keith is married and the proud father of three children. Reverend Keith Russell Lee, welcome back once again to Defining Moments. Really a pleasure for me to welcome you here today. And Brett, thank you so much for this privilege and opportunity to be with you. I enjoy so much when uh, we are together. No, it's my pleasure. Thank you for being here. Our topic today is the remnants of a slave religion in today's African American churches. And I'd like to begin by asking you to explain, before the emancipation of slaves, how was Christianity used to oppress slaves? Well, very uh, easy in terms of understanding um, that, of course, slavery was all about control. And the powers that were always looked for means and ways to be able to oppress. And so, uh, matter of fact, you may have heard of the, the famous, or the, rather the infamous, Willie Lynch letter, which is a, uh, a historical letter that was attributed for that time, which a wealthy slave owner in Virginia had uh, wrote a letter on how to be able to control um, the slaves. Well, Willie Lynch didn't talk about uh, Christianity or you know, religion, but yet, uh, but primarily though, Christianity, of course, was used to control the slaves. And, and, and specifically from the standpoint of being, number one, otherworldliness. So don't worry about life now, but you're going to get, get everything that you want in the afterlife. So continue to struggle, continue to suffer. Matter of fact, the more that you continue to suffer, the more that you become Christ-like, and God then will reward you in terms of heaven. For after all, this world is not your home anyway, of course. Um, a reference to Bunyan's, you know, Pilgrim Progress, of course, which was one of the the common books within the 16th and the 17th century that that uh, that early Christians read, meaning the white slave owners read. So otherworldliness was a part of it. The second aspect of it was being content with their life now. Just, you know, don't fight for justice. Don't want all of those things. God is a just God. As long as you have, uh, matter of fact, your salvation everything is okay. So just be happy in the state where you are, because of course God knows everything and God knows your plight, but again, going back to the otherworldliness. And so the social controls were always there to keep the slaves in their space and place. I think about the Apostle Paul um, and, and specifically the writing um, that, he, that he shares as far as, as uh, slaves being good you know, slaves, you know, don't disrespect, don't disobey the slave owners. And so all of those things were emphasized to keep the slaves in their space and in their place, not for them to revolt, not for them to think about some concept of freedom, but to be very much, this is what your lot is, God knows, and don't worry about it because you're going to be able to um, get it in heaven. Now, it's interesting because I just want to go a little bit further as far as that's concerned. That was not only from what was preached, because you have to remember also that the slave masters introduced Christianity to their slaves. They were the ministers, so to speak, of their slaves. And so they share the themes, of course, that benefited them. In addition to that, as time went on, they you know, were able to select men who were good slaves, who would also be able to share what the slave master told them because because remember it was illegal for slaves to be able to read or write and so all they were referring to and relating uh, relying on was what the slave master told them about this good and gracious God that wanted them to stay in their space and place mm -hmm. and another part um, not only in regards to what I've just simply shared the themes of Christianity was always the emphasis upon um, the wickedness of humankind, the wickedness that relied within every human being, and particularly the slave. So it would be that, you know, we're poor, wretched sinners, that we are, you know, all of our righteousness are that of filthy rags, uh, that we are, you know, nothing in Christ, that we're not worthy of anything because we are 
quote unquote sinners. That message, that Calvinist message that looked at the depravity of man was, was, was hammered in to the slaves so that they could not and would not ever look at themselves as being, you know, truly a child of God in the context of being an heir and a joint heir with Christ. Okay, very clear. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Explain to us how the remnants of a slave religion continue to oppress African Americans in America today. You don't have to be a social scientist or a preacher to be able to look at all of the issues that are affecting and how it's affecting the African American community in America. We have, you know, high incidence rates of breakdowns of marriage and family to, you know, crime and violence, you name it. We are dealing with it. However, the interesting thing is that within our communities, pretty much in the inner cities, the urban communities, is that there's churches on every corner. And in addition to that, uh, we are probably from, you know, some of the most religious folks that God has ever created and made. However, I dare suggest that there has to be a connection between then what is being preached on Sunday morning and then what is being demonstrated or lived out Monday through Saturday. And I dare suggest that what is being taught are remnants of a slave religion. Now, notice I said not necessarily slave religion, but remnants of a slave religion. And it's affecting our people because from the standpoints of much even as what slave religion did, which be other, don't be other world, be other worldliness. Don't be worried about the situations and the conditions now. Um, you know, um, be complacent with where you are. And then likewise that, you know, we're unworthy that, you know, our, our, we're nothing more than a filthy rag. You know, when I was growing up, literally, in terms of my uh, conservative uh, mainline um, church that I, I grew up in, I only heard messages of salvation that continued to emphasize that I was nothing more than a wretch. I was nothing more than a filthy rag. And Sunday after Sunday, that message, as that message is now being preached 40 years later, into communities that are telling people that, I mean, and I'm talking about not sinners, quote unquote, as we would def, uh, define them, but they're telling people who are supposedly born again, baptized, Holy Ghost filled believers of Christ Jesus, that they are nothing more than filthy rags. Now, contrasted with that, how is Calvinism expressed among white Christians in America, or how is it expressed? Well, uh, I'm glad that you made mention of that because one of the things that I did not share with you with John Calvin, the great um, church father, so to speak, that kind of shaped American Christianity. Um, John Calvin um, was a very, we would say, conservative uh, man who believed in the depravity of the human soul. He, uh, he felt that the only thing that could cure that, of course, was Jesus Christ, which is a traditional uh, Christian doctrine in which, in which I believe wholeheartedly. However, though, Calvin continued to emphasize that, you know, even if we confess the faith in Christ Jesus, only the elect would be, uh, would, would be saved. And no one really knows who the elect is, but that's only a special number of people. So not everyone would be saved. So everyone continued to live in a state of not really knowing whether or not they, they were saved or not. And it's interesting because in white America, you know, as you go back from the 1600s, um, of course, um, Jamestown, 1609, um, the Mayflower, I believe, 1611, or what have you. Um, they were already in America, the, 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 the colonialists, they were already working through um, doctrine. They were always, already working through what we're going to believe, what we're not going to believe, what we're going to accept, what we're not going to accept. So about time 1865 came around when the emancipation came, Calvin's influence had really waned in terms of, you know, the, uh, the depravity of, of humanity. That doctrine had really waned, so to speak, as it was then preached to the slaves. However, what the white folks, if I can use that word, basically emphasized was another Calvin focus was that, that believers 
uh, you had to work as unto the Lord. The Protestant Christian work ethic was attributed to that. So we work hard, we build up wealth. And of course, Calvin shared that because during Europe, during his day and time frame, um, the, the, the powers of religion that controlled his, his world was, number first of all, the Roman Catholic Church that had enormous wealth and, of course, did the Inquisitions and so forth and so on, a major power in Europe and great wealth. And, and then, likewise, um, the, the, the Jews within his area controlled the marketplace and so forth. Calvin realized that if Christianity was going to be able to make an impact, that then Christians... Protestants, if you will, would have to be able to create and generate wealth, and their churches would have to be very prosperous. Boy, that's a far cry from what is being preached and taught in the African-American church, which, though, the same man who created the doctrine by which we live by, even though the whites rejected fully that whole doctrine of of the depravity of the human soul and how bad we are and, and so forth and even continuing to be in the emphasis upon all of our righteousness that are filthy rags. The same man that shared that was lessened in that but yet he became greater in terms of you know wealth and creating that in, in, in the now. And it's really interesting because of the standpoint of you know again telling the slaves don't be worried about you know, creating wealth. You be happy with just the way things are. However, let us do all of the, the, the wealth building. Let us do all of the prosperity and the abundance. And it's interesting because even in the African American church, I, uh, I teach prosperity and abundance in my church. I believe that that's a divine right that we have as being a child of God. If we're heirs and we're joint heirs of God, and if God is, we should have wealth. Most um, African American families are hard-working people because of the standpoint, you know, they were taught that you work hard okay. and you work as unto the Lord. Our aim is not as high. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, most uh, most families I know definitely that are intact. I mean, there's hard-working men who take care of their their children and of they course. do all of the all of the right things by their their wife and or ex-wife and by their children, as far as that's concerned. However, though, we cannot ignore. The, the effect that, that as it relates to success and the way that we define success as in the community. And then, of course, we do have a, uh, an interesting now connection because uh, even though we talk about then wealth and success in those things, and, 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 but the way that it's played out in, in terms of the African, the African American community is always played out in terms of just materialism. How is God typically portrayed in African American churches today? I would say that God is portrayed um, much as he was in the uh, slavery period. A God who is angry, a God who is um, vengeful, a God who is a God of judgment, a God of wrath. Oh, but then we throw in, oh, God is love. But as we think about it, most of the time from sermons, in things, and I'm talking about not from the televangelists that 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 fill the screens who who come with a whole different brand of of Christianity. I'm talking about what is being taught in mainline, you know, denominational and even non-denominational churches across America. Because again, many people will look at, oh, you know, I watch so and so on television, and and they don't t teach that way. Okay, yeah, that's a whole different you know, conversation in another show for, for another time. Mm -hmm. But from the standpoint of the, 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 the average church, and the average church in America has, what, less than 100 members that, that, that meet at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. In those churches primarily, they are teaching a, a, and portraying of this God of anger, wrath, of, 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 of vengeance, and then they throw in, oh, God is love by the way. Now, if that be, continues to become our predominant view of God, then God is something to, be re, uh, to not be revered and to be looked at as Father who loves me. But it puts us in a state of, man, you know, I, you know, I mean, you know, I better not mess up because if I mess up, and it's interesting because in most conversations that I have with, with many people, they share, you know, if something's going on, going on in their life, oh, well, God is whooping me. Well, what do you mean God is whooping you? I mean, it's like even that reference 
is a reference back to slavery. God is whipping you. What, what, what do you mean? Well, God chasteneth those, they may use the scripture, God chasteneth those whom he loves. Well, hold it now. I mean, you know, um, I do understand that scripture, but when hardship and pain and suffering comes, why are we attributing that to God? When I, and I do believe, don't get me wrong, I do believe that there, that, that there are challenges. I do believe that there are, are things that, that we must endure. However, though we are quick to attribute that to God than to some of the, the choices and the decisions that we have made. Mm -hmm. Okay, very clear. Thank you. Do you feel Christianity in America is fulfilling its mandate from Christ, especially among African Americans? That's a very good question, Brett. And, you know, and I would say that Christianity, um, as it is being practiced now today, is not. I believe that if Jesus came back today, as you know, traditional uh, theology teaches, that you know, he's coming back for his church without spot, blemish, or wrinkle. That he would see a church, and I mean, you know, even even though I like to speak for the body of Christ at large, I'm talking about the black church in particular. He would see a church, I believe, that is missing the mark. And I say that because, again, looking at, of course, the community at large as it is, uh, and all of, again, the social ills and problems where even now churches are not addressing those things. We are like ostriches with our head in the sand, and we are saying, oh, Jesus, 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 he's going to do something about it. And, and I like the way that, that um, the, 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 the ancients declared that we are God's hands. We are God has no no hands. God has no feet. We are God's hands. We are God's feet. If we, as the church, do not stand up, rise up, and to address those issues and come up with solutions for those issues, because because what I because what I do see, Brett, is a lot of um, complaining, a lot of addressing the issues. That's one of the reasons why I don't get involved with a lot of of forums and so forth. Assigning blame. Yes, because we assign blame and we do a lot of talking about the problem, looking at the problem from different angles, this and any other, but we never talk about solutions of what is really necessary. If we are not teaching an empowered gospel that is teaching men and women what the scriptures declare, that they are created and made in the likeness and the image of God, if we are not teaching in the scriptures, that God has called them out of darkness into his wonderful light for a reason, and that we have a purpose, that we have a purpose and a plan, then we're missing the mark. And, and, and let me share how, how that plays out to the collective. That's not only individual, but collective. We know according to scripture that, yes, God uses people. And I'm meaning people like races. Well, the Hebrews, the Jews, were God's chosen people that he used for a purpose and for a plan. Wow, what if God is using the African Americans. Wow, what if there is a plan and a purpose, which I believe it is. You know, if you think about it, no one in the history of humanity, no one in the history of humanity has the unique history that African Americans have. 400 years of the Middle Passage. Matter of fact, as one historian has declared, if we drained right now the Atlantic Ocean, the bottom would be littered with the path of bones leading from West Africa all the way to the new land, the new world. Nowhere in the history of civilization has, it, has human history has known the suffering of the type of slavery that existed during the slave trade from the 1400s to 1865. And some races ha are now extinct, literally. But still, African Americans are here. And I believe that because God has a plan for his people. And so if that is not being taught, we're going to continue to give ourselves to, guess what, drugs, alcohol. We're going to give ourselves to all these other things that are happening and affecting. We're going to continue to be able to, our, sorry, our kids are going to grow up not thinking that there's a purpose and, 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 and planning their life between the ages of, uh, or, or to check out at 19 years old. When you talk to these gang members and things of that nature, they're not planning to live beyond 19, 20, 21 years old. These wonderful, powerful men. And the church is, oh, guess what? We don't want to deal with them. My, um, uh, my experience has been just so amazing how it seems that no one is caring about 
a lost generation that is right now in terms of really the lost past two generations. And the church, again, is not addressing it because you know what? Those people don't pay tithes. They don't pay offerings. It's too much to be able to go. Oh, that's just so much. Even though that they're souls, and even though there are people that look like you and I, Paul had said it so well in Romans, the 10th chapter. Romans, uh, where he says that my heart's desire for God is for Israel that they might be saved, my people, the people that I'm a part of, that they might be saved, that they might come into the fullness of God. And I can't, you know, and I mean, and and again, I'm in a suburban community, things are really great for me, but yet I cannot say I'm successful until everyone is saved, filled with the Spirit of God, and living, as I talk about in my book, The 14 Principles of Power, Faith, and Living, living that extraordinary and phenomenal life. Okay, thank you very much. I want to ask you to briefly examine Christianity in America, uh, especially concerning the individual and the family. Uh, Contrast for us what's missing in Christian America today, and what would be possible if a spiritual reformation were to take place? Well, man, if a spiritual reformation took place, that would be a powerful thing, and, and, and really a spiritual reformation, and I want to say that as opposed to revolution. I don't think there's anything wrong with Christianity. So, you know, I know that there's been some that it says, oh, we need to throw, you know, throw it out, you know. No, we don't need to throw the baby out with the bath water. It is not Christianity, it's how we've been really practicing Christianity and what we've been emphasizing. And again, you think about it. The systems of slavery were in place for over 400 years. Over 400 years, families, you know, and people were dealing with that programming, which was passed on through family teachings, subtle and not so subtle, through then, like I said now, remnants of slave religion, And it continues to be a part and persist. Now, if we ever reform, we say, look at that, says, you know what? Oh, man, I never thought about that. Every time I talk about the remnants of slave religion, people say, I never really thought about it. You're absolutely right. Well, if we begin to address that and become aware of that, and then minds and hearts begin to change based upon as we now take another look, look at Christianity through another lens, a lens that is empowering, a God of love, a God of, 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 of mercy, a God of, 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 of a desire for his people to be like him because he made us and created us in his likeness image and he seeks to manifest himself in us and through us even as us. So I'll begin looking at that through another lens, a powerful lens. Man, first of all, to the family we begin honoring the divinity of husband and wife. Wow, imagine that. Where two people understand, man, what God is doing and manifesting within me, and now that I could see God, I see God also in you. And then understanding purpose, as I shared on another program with you before, and that, that I believe every family has a unique purpose to fulfill. And then from that standpoint, then of how that is then demonstrated in society at large. Man, because, you know, the home continues to be the major place of education. And again, we want to blame the church. We want to blame the the, the school. We want to blame the federal government. We want to blame, you know, somebody else. When the blame falls with and was solely upon our shoulders, what was that old uh, song? It's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me. It, 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 it's been the choices that I've made. It's because my house is not in order. But once our, our homes get in order, it begins to be played out in a very real context of demonstrating and manifesting the fruits of God's Spirit within that home and then within terms of society at large. And that, I believe, can transform and change. And then what happens, we begin raising the bar in regards to things of life. Because, see, the reality of the fact is that because how can I talk about peace, how can I talk about solutions to the problems as long as my head is that I'm I'm no good? So the value of life is diminished. That is why a 12-year-old child can pick up a handgun and blow another child away with no regard to life because of the standpoint he has never been taught the divinity in that child and the possibility of that child's life. 
because that was never taught within home. And because all he heard, maybe, or somebody heard in his family, oh, y'all ain't nothing but filthy rags, and, and anything y'all get is unworthy, and all of those other things. And so imagine, though, if that is beginning to be taught. And if that message didn't come through the church, then they're getting perhaps a similar message from the music and the culture, no? Oh, yeah, definitely. And, you know, it's interesting. Um, you know, I, I, I'm uh, in a Ph.D. program, and I had to take a church, uh, a Christian education course recently. And so I was like, oh, Christian education, you know, I took that 20 years ago. Oh, you know, this is going to be a breeze course and so forth and so on. And then I'm reading this book, and I'm like, wow, Christian education has changed. And the number one thing that changed Christian education, because, of course, I was educated in the 1950s paradigm where media was not as prominent. Now, everything deals with the influence of the media. Matter of fact, our children spend more time in front of the TV than engaging their parents. They spend more time listening to the, the, the rap artists and the, and the popular artists than they do their own parents. And really, if you really break it down, even in terms of their teachers. So now, who becomes the teacher? Who becomes the influencer? It becomes then, you know, the, the record companies. It becomes then the, the disc jockeys. It becomes then the, the, the great media conglomerates. We don't even have time to get into the fact of how much money they're making uh, on the backs of the lives of the people they're destroying. We don't right. have time to get into that in today's show. But I want to be able to share where there's some responsibility that is there. Mm -hmm. However, though, again, my thing is always about supply and demand. And where the church has missed it, because see, the church, if we continue to teach an empowering gospel, we could have, could have affected the supply, or rather the demand, a long time ago. Yeah. And so guess what? Record companies will say, you know what? There's no money here. There's no money here. We need to do something else. Yes. You know, and when there becomes a greater um, demand for things that are positive and uplifting and so forth. Matter of fact, uh, Mel Gibson's movie, the, uh, the Passion of the Christ which has now opened a whole new segment mm -hmm. of the marketplace because guess what? Hollywood found out, oh, Christians will go to movies and they will support it. Man, so now let's start coming out with some different movies that will appeal specifically to that. And then let's develop some other products that will go along with that because they found out that, wow, there's a whole new thing. And so the, the, the corporate America will go wherever the demand is yes. and they will supply that mm -hmm. and so I believe churches as we preach that empowering gospel yeah. that we can be able to impact and affect. Okay very clear. Well on that note I want to thank you once again Reverend Keith Russell Lee for being our guest today on The Defining Moment. What you've shared today is just so insightful and uh, so em empowering for uh, our viewers. So I want to really thank you for being our guest today. Thank you so much Britt. My pleasure. Look forward to coming back soon. Please do. You've been watching The Defining Moment for Creating the Culture of Conscience. You can find us on the internet at www.definingmoment.tv. Thanks for watching and have a great day.